Hi, I'm Mark Tyrrell of Uncommon Knowledge and welcome to how to motivate change in your clients with the curiosity gap. Five ways to open the mind to therapeutic change. Now the writer William Arthur Ward said, curiosity is the wick in the candle of learning. And that's a lovely description of how curiosity can ignite learning and maybe even the first step to wisdom. I think that the peaking of curiosity may be an underrated yet powerful strategy in therapy and coaching. When a client becomes overwhelmingly curious about their own potential and or the potential of a situation, when they feel they just have to know whether they can do something or be something different, then we have powerful therapeutic motivation. So I'll give you an example. Early in my career, an older gentleman, John, came in for therapy and he was lonely and sometimes a little depressed. And I noticed he talked about one subject above all else. It seemed he was growing fond of a woman who worked in a store in which he delivered most days. He was widowed and so was she. But they had uh, more in common than this. You know, she laughed at his jokes and seemed to like him. But something was really nagging away at John. And he asked me, how can I be sure she likes me? And uh, further than that, how can I be sure she likes me enough to go out with me? Uh, you know, so John wanted surety in an ambiguous world where sureties are never really guaranteed. He feared that if he asked this woman out and she refused, uh, word would get out and the other store workers would think he was creepy or a loser. Okay, those were his words. He was terrified at the thought of being gossiped about each day when he made his deliveries to this particular store if he asked her out and she said no. Before we get to what happened with John, I just want to talk about why and how we can recruit the power of curiosity to facilitate change within our clients. So, what's it all about? Why, how, when, who, what questions are themselves the result of our innate curiosity? Early humans wanted to know the best ways to hunt animals, to uh, grow crops, map the stars and cure the body. We felt an insatiable need to find out. What's the truth? Innate human curiosity was the springboard to survival, philosophy, science, exploration, the arts, and all the other fields of human development. Curiosity is what pushes us to learn and keeps us young in spirit. Curiosity is such a powerful and central feature of being human. It would be strange then not to use it to benefit our clients, to kindle the fire even if initially it may be little more than a tiny spark. Curiosity, a kind of open-minded expectancy, can align clients to therapeutic improvement and actually drive them towards that improvement. And it's useful to remember something. Your clients are already curious. The pure fact that your client is coming to see you means on some level they're curious as to whether you'll offer what they really need, whether you can really help them. All you have to do then is build upon that curiosity. Practitioners who use hypnosis know a lot about using curiosity, expectancy, as a way of guiding clients into therapeutic trance. Such openness to new experience and possibility is often so central to hypnotic inductions. Just what can your mind do? What are you capable of? What talents does your unconscious mind have? What is possible for you to discover? So this openness and curiosity about one's own therapeutic potential is often the first step towards a greater belief that actually, yes, I can get better. I can be different. This is something I've long believed, but I was intrigued to see some uh, recent research supporting this idea. So a psychological study found that curiosity can be used to help people change their behavior to make healthier choices. So the researchers 
were curious to discover whether and how people's behavior changed when their curiosity was piqued. Over four experiments, they found that curiosity can indeed drive people to make behavioral changes. Dr. Evan Polman, the study's lead author, explained that creating a curiosity gap can strongly motivate behavior. He stated, and, and I'm quoting him here, peaking curiosity influences choices, steering individuals away from unhealthy temptations and toward healthier options. For instance, in one experiment, 71% of participants chose a plain fortune cookie over a chocolate covered sugary one due to the promise of personal information inside the less sugary one. So the drive to know what this fortune cookie says about me overcame a sweet tooth. Similarly, people who were motivated by the promise of the secret to a magic trick or the answer to a trivia question when questions were posed at the bottom of the stairs with the promise that the answer would be provided on the stairwell somewhere, there was a 9.8% increase in stairwell use. Okay, so imagine if someone becomes really curious to discover, say, how a month from uh, after taking the stairs, how that will change their body composition. If we can help clients become really curious about that, we can uh, increase healthy behavior. So we can see how curiosity can be linked to healthier choices and can be used as motivational fuel until the behavior then simply feels more natural to do than not to do. In other words, until it becomes a habit. Dr. Polman emphasized that curiosity-based interventions such as uh, th these can at a minimal cost and can effectively promote positive actions. So clearly curiosity is a motivational force and we need our clients to be motivated. And in fact, maybe you already use curiosity in your practice. In fact, I'm pretty sure you probably do, even if you hadn't really thought about it in those terms. Maybe you even use some of the following strategies, but hopefully you'll find a little something here to help you make the most of your client's curiosity. So, so tip number one, express your curiosity. The great Dr. Milton Erickson once said, I'm very curious to discover what's possible. I'll often express how curious I am about some idea or desire the client has. So with John, I expressed at some length just how curious I was to discover what it'd feel like if he never asked Sue out. And when he started to imagine that, it made him feel sad and regretful. I said to him, I wonder what you'd feel like, John, if in 10 years time you look back having never taken the plunge. And I expressed that I really had no way of knowing how he'd feel about that if he never even tried. I wondered aloud how maybe knowing something bad was sometimes better than the dull but continuous ache of never finding out the truth of something at all. He really thought about that. I also expressed how curious I was to know how he'd feel if at least he tried. My curiosity seemed to increase and infect him with curiosity. I also expressed curiosity as to whether she'd accept his invitation for a date or not. How can we ever know? How can we ever know? At least we'd know one way or another. And I went on like that almost ad nauseum, being curious as to what would happen in this scenario, in that scenario, uh, whether she'd accept, whether she wouldn't accept, whether people would, would uh, talk about it at all, whether they would for a while talk about it, then move on, uh, whether it would be all they'd talk about, whether they'd be pleased if she accepted and so on, or even if whether uh, he asked her out and she said no, she'd be pleased that he'd asked her out, even if she hadn't accepted, or other people would be pleased for her that he'd asked her out, even if she'd, even if she'd said no. So I was, I was getting, I was building curiosity about all these possible scenarios and how we just didn't know and the ache of not knowing was worse than knowing whatever the outcome. And after a time, 
such um, toing and froing can drive people to a kind of exasperated action. Oh, for God's sake, I just need to find out. No more whether this or whether that. Becoming sick of indecision can be a powerful way of driving action. So simply wondering aloud and asking rhetorical Socratic questions can help build a sense of wanting to actually discover the truth inside a possibility and feeling almost desperate to just find out the truth of something. And, you know, we can also ask our clients direct curiosity building questions. So tip number two, how will it be? I've often used curiosity in therapy. When treating a spider phobia, for example, I might ask the client how they suppose their loved ones will react once they discover the client's fear has gone without the client having told them. We can also build curiosity around their wider life generally. You know, how will they be different? You know, uh, With a drinker or a smoker, I might ask them what they imagine it's going to feel like to no longer be preoccupied with these interloping substances. Okay, what's life going to be like? What will they be doing and thinking about instead, do they suppose? Or who's going to notice first um, when, uh, when they're no longer smoking or, or drinking, okay? Um, or when they're coming out of depression, who's going to notice first, okay, without them telling them that they're no longer depressed? Will it be people at work? Will it be their loved ones? Who's it going to be? Um, who's going to notice first when they've got 20 pounds slimmer? Will it be a family member, someone at work, you know, or someone else? Uh, so we can, of course, be much more open-ended than this. So tip three, notice something unexpected. People have a need to switch off loops of expectancy. You know, so w something's begun and we want to complete it. We want to know how the thrilling movie ends or who committed the murder in the crime novel, uh, what the punchline is to the joke and the solution to the mystery of where the heck we put our car keys. So I'll sometimes task my clients to notice something unexpected after they've started sleeping really well again or while calmly delivering a speech they've been nervous about or uh, making or, 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 or over the first week of being a non-smoker. What will they notice? Something they didn't expect to notice. So we're, you know, that something unexpected can pique their curiosity and attaching satisfied curiosity to a therapeutic game can be very powerful. I might even add, and this unexpected thing may be wonderful or simply really good, or just something you'd never considered before, but be sure to notice it and write it down once you've noticed it. So I had one client who had been paralyzed by fear of socializing. I helped her overcome that fear then asked her to notice something nice and unexpected at an upcoming social event. And she later reported uh, she'd suddenly become aware of how bright and beautiful the colors seemed to be in the house she was in. I didn't see that one coming. Another client told me that the first time he saw a spider after our work together, he started to run away through habit before realizing he was actually not afraid anymore no longer scared and bursting into laughter at having run away. Yet another client told me that in the supermarket, she just focused on the healthiest foods and it was like the unhealthy food stuff, just wasn't even there and so on. In each case, the client was intrigued by what they'd notice. Of course, the language we use can also increase curiosity. So tip four, use curiosity building words and phrases. We're often encouraged to build a sense of confidence by using certainties and definitive statements such as you are fantastic or you will succeed and such like. However, to build curiosity, we can also artfully express not knowingness, but intriguing uncertainty. You could pepper your language with words like maybe or perhaps or wonder or curious or interesting and discover. You could use phrases such as, I really don't know just how you're going to first notice 
that you're becoming slimmer. Maybe the soles of your feet will notice first that you're becoming lighter before even your conscious mind notices. Or maybe the first sign will be something else entirely. I wonder who will be the first to notice you're coming out of that depression without you telling them. It might surprise you to discover who notices first. Maybe it will be your mother, but it might not be. It could be. So we're there by attaching a sense of discovery to the preferred future state of the client. So I used all these kinds of phrases with John. How would he feel when he made up his mind to ask Sue out? Okay, how was he going to know that he was about to ask her out? What would that feeling be like? Would he feel determined, scared, but determined, happy he'd at last made a decision, any decision? I really couldn't tell him how he was going to feel and how he was going to feel might even surprise him. So notice I didn't want to build up a sense of certainty that Sue would definitely say yes, because we couldn't control for that. Rather a sense that it was fascinating okay, for him to find out. Okay. And that neither of us knew at the moment, in, but in time we would know. And we needed to know. And the urge just to know, yes or no, was the main thing we focused on. He, la he later told me he'd been surprised to suddenly feel a sense of sweeping peace when at last he decided to ask Sue out. And that once he'd decided, he just had to know one way or the other. Almost as if finding out was the, the aim in itself rather than her necessarily saying yes, which of course would be a nice side effect of asking her. Lastly, we can build up a sense of curiosity directly. So tip five, evoke a general sense of curiosity. We can evoke a sense of burning curiosity in our clients before attaching that sense of needing to make a discovery to the client's therapeutic goals. So I might ask a client about a time they were really curious to discover something, you know, opening a present and they really wanted to know what was inside. Or um, during hypnotic work, I might simply evoke a scenario of a child opening a gift, not knowing what the wrapping and box contains, but needing desperately to find out, being excited to just find out. I might ask the client to imagine being that child. What does that huge burning curiosity feel like? And then I start to attach it to therapeutic gain. Or I might evoke seeing a magic trick done or that feeling when you've forgotten something, but you feel you really want to recall it. What does intense curiosity feel like in the stomach, in the hands, in the mind? How do we know when we have an overriding curiosity about something or someone? Someone tells you a bit of gossip about someone, but they haven't told you what it is yet, and you really want to know. What is that really wanting to know sensation feeling like? With John, I wanted him to be focused more on curiosi curiosity than on feeling Sue had to accept his invitation for a date. That's what we focused on. I wanted him to be more focused on finding an answer than the right answer. So while upping his curiosity, I was sure to incorporate a sense of intrigue about how he'd manage uh, the situation if she said no to his request for a date. How was he going to feel? We explored ways he'd thrive even if she said no. So he could be curious as to how he'd manage even a negative outcome. One day, John discovered that he just couldn't not ask Sue out anymore. He went to the store as usual and feeling open and curious rather than afraid, he suggested they could go out for dinner sometime together. And she said she'd love to go for a meal with him. And she seemed excited. And the next time I saw John, he asked me why he'd made such a fuss about asking her out in the first place. So I suggested he could be curious about that. So I hope you found that useful. And if you did, please hit like and subscribe. And if you want to hear when my next video is published, hit the notification bell below. I'm Mark Tyrrell of Uncommon Knowledge. And if you'd like to uh, subscribe to my email newsletter, you can find it over at unc.com.
unk.com, that's unk.com forward slash blog. And thanks for watching. Thank you.